I'm really excited to um, be doing the presentation. So this is the first year with uh, Mark Usum, And uh, many of you may not know Mark, um, but uh, Mark works behind the scenes, uh, or primarily behind the scenes, uh, working with Andy Fishman and, his, uh, and, and with his clients, as well as Mark works on the investment committee and the investment group with us. A uh, little bit about Mark. Um, Mark is, uh, received his MBA from University of Chicago with School of Business. He's worked as a research analyst at Salman Brothers Smith Barney, and for 15 years he ran a hedge fund. So he, uh, he brings a lot of breadth and depth to the investment group, um, and we're really excited to have him, and it's been, it's been great. Mark is, really, Mark is like a brother from another mother for me. Um, <laughs> so it's, uh, it's really exciting to have Mark as, as part of the team. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it's like uh, there's someone who I can talk to. <laughs> um, but it's really great. And, um, and over the last year, we've done a lot with, uh, with investments. And we'll, we'll talk about some of the changes that we've made, um, a lot of really positive things. Um, of course, some disclosures. And again, what we want to talk about today is um, some, a little bit about our investment process, things that we've been doing, uh, overview of 2016 and a market overview, our outlook for 2017 and what those takeaways are, and then uh, questions and answers. And again, this is being recorded, so I'll, we'll repeat the, the questions and answers. And everything should be in the, the right order. Um, so a little bit about the finance investment process I want to talk to you about. As, uh, as we said, we added Mark Usum to the team. Um, Mark and I both sit on the investment committee. We have an investment committee that meets about every other week. Um, Steve and Andy are also part of that investment committee, and we talk about what's going on in the markets, the portfolios, economy, et cetera, and, uh, and really take a look at that. We also uh, hired a number of third-party consultants over the year, and actually over the years. I mean, this is not new. Um, some of those look at um, our beliefs and our process and just our thought process in general um, and spend a lot of time on that. Others look at more uh, strategic and what, what the effects of those allocations are. And uh, the team that we have is a number of, uh, we have people with you know, a PhD after their name and CFAs and just a, a wide range of background and really coming from uh, people who've worked for, again, like Nobel laureates and, and really a very sharp group of people. Um, we really formalized a lot of the strategies over uh, 2016 and have, and we're happy to talk to you um, in your meeting with your advisor about what specific strategies you're in and how those strategies came about. And there's a, there's a lot of process going on in terms of what we, what we do behind the scenes. We also made a, a significant investment in software, um, a variety of different types of software. Some of them are analytical tools, some of them are reporting tools, some of them are rebalancing tools, really to help us uh, manage the portfolios, understand what's happening and facilitate trading. And, uh, and that's really, I think it's helped. Again, a lot of this is behind the scenes, you don't see this, but uh, even, Having um, seamless trading, you know, directly from our system into TD Ameritrade electronically. I mean, little things like that, but can make a, a significant improvement. And so, what has that done? That's allowed us for the last year, I believe, we've had every quarterly report. We've had an investment commentary page, uh, one to two pages, talking about what's happened in the quarter, what our thinking is. And so that we've been able to add that service, add that feature, as well as we've tried to communicate to you. Uh, since November, we've had two emails that were sent out with regards to uh, our new presidents and impacts that it may have had. We had an email about Brexit. And so really, again, trying to provide more investment information, investment commentary to you and, and get out there in terms of our thinking. We also, in the, the I think last quarter of 2016, have a blog. So we have a blog on our website. We're posting pretty much every week uh, about Different, different topics, whether it's investment related or if it's in general, uh, you know, various articles that we put out. Our newsletter came out Friday, I believe. Um, was sent out Friday. 
again, a variety of different topics, some financial planning, some investments, some just um, things happening like our, our um, marketing director had a new baby and, uh, in January. So things like that, that we're able to communicate what's going on. Okay, moving on. So what I wanna talk about is um, narrow subject, subject, which is the economy and what's been going on and the market returns. And obviously you have to have a lot of, little bit of humility as you're discussing uh, what's going on and what we think is, is gonna happen um, because right things can surprise us. So we wanna talk about stock and bond market returns, the US economy, the Trump effect, uh, internationally what's been going on and bonds uh, US and international. So a lot, of, a lot of stuff to talk about. And so with that, you know, it looks like we're out of time. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> no, so with that, I will actually turn it over to Mark. Thanks, Seth. Thanks for that uh, nice introduction. Welcome, everybody. Um, I, I always feel like when we're going to give a, a forecast about something that um, I feel a little bit like the weather, weather person, the weather people, of, you know, they get it wrong most of the time and it's fine. And as economists, we get it wrong all the time and it's still fine. So, <laughs> but the weather people have more uh, respect than we do. So anyways, let's turn to some of the data. Um, last year was really a year of two parts. The first part of the year was exciting because the market went down a lot. Right out of the gate, right after the first of the year, market was down almost 10%. Um, and bonds did really well. And that continued through the first part of the year. The second part of the year was almost a mirror image, particularly after the election, when stocks did really well and bonds underperformed. So some of the numbers for the year, large companies up 12%, small up 26 year. Um, and bonds, the first part of the year up 15 and then down 12. All in all though, assets, all, all asset classes remain positive for the year. It's a pretty good year overall. So what does the current economy look like? Looks pretty good. Continued growth, we think. Sort of a plow horse economy, just keeps chugging along. Uh, the, reco the recovery is entering about the ninth year, and we think it'll continue at about a 2% uh, GDP growth rate. We've got improving unemployment, increased household income, consumers looking pretty good. The Fed has uh, ended their quantitative easing and they've started raising rates a little bit because the economy is strong. Um, and finally, the election, uh, we've got Republicans controlling all parts of the legislature and the presidency. So we will, I'm sure, see some activity uh, on that side. Based on the numbers, uh, it's pretty dramatic. In 2008, the unemployment rate skyrocketed over 10%. 10 per, 10 it's come down steadily since then, and we're about 4.7% now. At the same time, wages fell back to sort of cyclical lows and have been coming up, but more gradually than in, in past um, expansions. So we have, we have still not too much wage pressure, even though unemployment, unemployment rates really fallen. This consumer is still looking good. Financial obligations ratio shows debt service as a percentage of disposable income. And it's again, dropped pretty dramatically from 2008 to about a 10% level. So the consumer is still in good shape. If we look at a long chart of GDP, this goes back to 1950. You can see it's really cyclical. The economy goes up and down over time. The amplitude you can sort of see, it's a little hard, has actually reduced over time. And it's smoothed out a little bit as monetary policy has been more effective in controlling the economy. We're now at about a 2% rate, and we've sort of just been fairly steady around one and a half to 2% for the past several years. We think that probably continues. In the near term, GDP, this is a little bit of an outlier, but it's sort of, it's sort of gone down and then back up. The last quarter, third quarter was good. It's been revised up twice already. So the economy looks pretty strong, but we did have this sort of dip through the first part of the year reflected in corporate earnings. Yeah, one of the things that we noticed is this big kind of dip in growth. And 
We also noticed a big drop in corporate earnings. And I'm going to skip one extra slide and show you this is year, this is year over year quarterly earnings. And we saw a number of quarters in a row that had decreasing quarterly earnings. And that became worrisome to us in kind of end of 2014, 2015, because in order for prices, stock prices to grow, there has to be earnings. There has to be earnings growth. And we were seeing the opposite. Even when we pulled out, we did pull out oil because we know that there was a big, um, big issues a crash in the oil industry. And it certainly made a difference in um, the earnings, which is the red line, but you still had some drop there. Um, and so the question started becoming, well, what we noticed is that there was this drop, this black line is earnings and there was this drop in earnings, but the blue line is stock prices. And what we found is that stock prices were kind of holding somewhat steady for a period of time and then took off. And we had this kind of disconnect in terms of why is it that earnings have been going down but stock prices have been either holding steady or going up. Um, and even the economy has been growing, slow, but still growing. So what we did is we did something interesting and we decided let's take a look at growth by state and what's been happening by state. And we, the results we found are really fascinating. They want to share. If you look at the middle of the country, um, you'll see the color brown. And basically the brown is um, states that have been shrinking in growth. So GDP had been shrinking. Minnesota's flat at 0.2%. Um, and this is for, I think this was from 2014 to 2000, mid-2016. Mid um, and part of this we know, I mean, 11.4% shrinkage in the economy in North Dakota. And we know that, right, there's been this, uh, with, with the Bakken uh, Basin, that there's been a significant decrease. Notice, however, on the coasts, you've seen growth. So Washington, Oregon, California, you've seen significant uh, GDP growth. On the coast here, you've seen, again, both coasts, you've seen significant growth. Exceptions um, in terms of middle of the country, right? Michigan has been a recovery in the auto industry. We've also had some recovery, significant growth in Florida. And so what we think has been going on is that we've been actually in a period of what we're calling a stealth recession. In other words, We've actually been going through 2014 to 2000, end of 2016 or so. Um, there really has been a significant slowdown in the economy, and, uh, but it's been isolated. It's been isolated geographically to the middle of the country uh, and isolated by industry. That being said, kind of going back a couple slides, uh, going back a slide, if you look at anticipated earnings for 2016, we know, we believe that there's gonna be a recovery in the oil industry. Uh, oil prices are twice as high as they were six months ago. And so what we think we, we could very likely see is what we're calling an earnings surprise. I mean, I guess not a surprise if you're expecting it, but at least we think that there could be a significant increase in earnings, uh, year over year earnings with the recovery in the oil. And if that's the case, then kind of going back here and looking at the stock price and stock earnings, it's very possible that the, the rise in stock prices is really due to either anticipating that earnings rise or that earning or that stock prices could go even higher based upon, again, what we're calling an earnings surprise. So that's, again, over 2017, some, some positive news. And you can really see that, again, this stealth recession concept in the before middle of 2016, the last high we had in the stock market was back in May of 2015. And from May of 2015 to July of 2016, we never broke through that high. So basically we had three different attempts to um, have a correction in the stock market. We had basically issues with China at the end of 2015. We then had a, a um, an effect in the stock market based upon the Fed raising rates, and then this one, Brexit. So each time there was this attempt at a correction in the stock market, we went down roughly, I think 11% was the total drop in 2016, the intra-year drop, but never really kind of this full-blown recession. Um, and partly I think it was just this isolated. We think that we're, we're out of that at this point in time. And again, that has nothing to do with who's president or what policies they are. You know, we're really not looking at that. 
We're simply looking at what the data seems to be suggesting and that there may be a reason outside of the presidency for what's really going on with the stock market and what that outlook could look like, which is, uh, which is quite positive. Okay, so that's the good news um, that, we, you know, that we think that is out there. At the same time, we do think that there are a number of headwinds to the stock market. Um, some of them are, are cyclical, but we also see some of them that are secular. So a lot of the uh, tailwinds that we see are more cyclical nature. In other words, recovery of the oil market. Some of the headwinds we see are more, se or are more secular and more long-term um, issues. And we're gonna go through that. So the, the first one is um, the headwinds that we see is number one, stock valuations are high. US and international debt levels are high. Economies at full employment, hard to grow if everyone's working um, because you can't find workers. Demographics and productivity, long-term issues that we see, and something um, outside, foreign events that could spill over and impact negatively impact the U.S. So first, we'll look at stock prices. Looking at a 10-year weighted, 10-year uh, smoothed earnings, the average, our price divided by earnings ratio or P/E ratio is at 28 times earnings, and that is expensive. By again, by historical measures. We're, we're not where we were in 1999-2000, which was, again, an extreme level, but we are, uh, stocks are expensive, which means one of two things has to happen, again, over a longer period of time, that either earnings needs to increase and bump up, which is something that we think is going to happen, or returns are gonna have to be lower, Fut future expected returns are gonna have to be lower than what we've experienced in the past. So that we think is, again, not saying what's gonna happen in 2017, but looking out over the next 10 years or so, um, that's, that to us is a headwind. The other thing is the dollar. So since 2014, the dollar has increased 40%. So if you're thinking of traveling abroad, now is the time. <laughs> Go outside the United States um, because things are a lot cheaper, um, hotel rooms, food, et cetera, than they've been in a really long time. So that's the good news. Um, the bad news is that if you are in the United States and you're trying to export, your products have gotten a lot more expensive. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is that if you're a multinational company, like let's say Coca-Cola, where more than half of the revenue is outside of the United States, and you have to translate those foreign revenue, even though the amount of foreign revenue may be the same, but you're translating it into dollars for reporting purposes, for income reporting purposes, guess what? You've got a uh, haircut in your revenue numbers because of the strength of the, the dollar. So that to us is, again, multinationals are gonna have, are ha gonna have issues with regards to, uh, to dollar strength. It also puts a little bit of a cap on um, inflation as well, again, because imports for us are cheaper. So, that, again, just something that we think is gonna make it difficult for, uh, that's gonna be the one challenge to earnings. Going on with other headwinds, um, the US economy has been driven in part by monetary policy, and this is an image of the Federal Reserve balance sheet. So this has various events starting in 08 when um, the Fed first injected liquidity into our system, and They've been adding to uh, the balance sheet ever since. And so it's gone from about a trillion dollars to about four and a half trillion. And uh, with a $17 trillion economy, it's about a 6% boost each time they add a trillion dollars. So, you know, trillion here, trillion there, it starts to add up. Um, but we've changed now. We've gone from this accommodative monetary policy to um, a more restrictive policy and starting to raise rates. So it's bad news, good news in a way, because the good news is the, the Fed thinks the economy is strong enough to stand on its own, doesn't still need all the support that it's been giving it, and it's starting to return rates to a more normal level. That means higher rates is a little bit, again, of a headwind to the economy. You know, in the, in the, uh, on the side note, they're basically saying, look, we're gonna try to slow things down a little bit. It's hot enough. This is, this is actually the, the uh, mortgage-backed securities they bought. This is a category called other that the Fed held and actually reduced um, in this early part. Along the same lines as the Fed increased the balance sheet, our jet 
debt to GDP ratio increased from modest levels in the 90s of around 70% to 104%. So clearly the stimulus has been reflected in this debt to GDP ratio, and that has a crowding out effect. So as the government spends more and more, um, it tends to crowd out private investment. And as debt to GDP ratios increase, statistically we know that that tends to slow economic growth. This is something that's been happening across the world. We'll show you more of that. At the same time, employment, which we saw has, has uh, fall, unemployment has fallen dramatically. And again, we're at sort of cyclic, towards cyclical lows. Doesn't mean anything's gonna happen tomorrow, but definitely um, is a uh, headwind to further growth as we've already gone so far. Another, another interesting point is income distribution. This gets talked about a lot, but it's, it's really um, dramatic in this particular slide showing the top 1% of earners and the bottom 50%. And you can see the top 1% has gone from 12 to 20%, while the bottom 50% has gone the other way from 20 down to about uh, 13. So income, income inequality has also been uh, shown to be something that slows GDP growth. And so this is something that, that I think um, we have to wrestle with in our economy in particular. And I, and I think that something that is being brought up now in Washington for sure. So long-term drivers of economic growth are the things we talked about, employment and productivity. So up here you can see the uh, size of the workforce has been shrinking. And as the baby boomers have aged, and they've started to retire, the size of the workforce has fallen. Now, we know there's millennials coming behind them, but there's a little gap in between, and that's part of what we're seeing here. At the same time, um, productivity has actually fallen. It's been, a, it's been a long term secular decline, but the combination of, of fewer workers and declining productivity, we think also is a headwind to further GDP growth. So um, a year ago, I spoke and I said I could guarantee one thing. And the thing I could guarantee is that there was going to be an election. <laughs> and uh, we had an election. And uh, the other thing I said is that markets like certainty. So we had an election. We're certain who the president is. Uh, certainly, if you talk to someone who's a Democrat, uh, it's uh, the apocalypse has arrived. And if you're a Republican, it's the Messiah. Um, we, today, we're not going to talk politics in terms of what our opinions are, but we are going to talk about what it is that Trump's policies are and how that's going to affect you and the economy and the stock market. And because there are, it's really kind of a little bit of a mixed bag. Um, so what are the positives that uh, Trump has proposed that we think is positive, again, for the economy and the stock market? And that is uh, dec lower, lower regulation. So. There's been a significant increase in regulation over the last eight years. Companies spend a lot of time and money uh, working through that regulation. And so some of that decreased regulation could decrease corporate costs. Um, also, he's talked about lowering taxes. So lowering corporate taxes, lowering personal taxes, that could be good for corporations, that could be good for individuals, allow, again, higher earnings, more spending of money by individuals. And he's talked about allowing bringing in money from overseas, kind of um, making the tax rate more fair for, overseas, for companies who have earned dollars overseas, allowing them to bring them into the country. All that could spur growth in the economy and in the stock market. And finally, he's talked about increased infrastructure spending. We know that again, uh, nationally, our, our bridges and our roads are in state of disrepair. And again, bringing money into the system and doing those things could be, uh, very positive. On the other hand, there are some negatives that he uh, has been bringing up as well that we think would negatively impact the stock market and the economy. So some of those are uh, his belief against free trade. So we know that uh, yesterday he signed an executive order to pull out of the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership. Uh, so far, we really haven't seen a immediate impact to the stock market, but again, our belief is that free trade uh, hurts economic growth and hurts the economy and the stock market. And we would expect uh, 
net, we'll see what how that impacts, but we do think that that reduces our um, our stock expectation. Um, The lack of free blocking free trade, putting add, adding tariffs, um, not allowing for free trade. Because what it does is that country who may be able to make that product the cheapest is not able to, um, you're not getting the advantages of each country. So the other thing that uh, Trump has talked about is immigration. We just talked about the fact that employment is at lows and it's hard to grow the economy if you don't have workers. And so some of his thoughts on immigration we believe would also be harmful to the economy and the stock market. There's certainly geo, geopolitical issues that he could bring up that could be negative. Uh, the healthcare, the Obamacare, we don't know what he's gonna do. But again, that may be more expensive for uh, companies than what, what they're saying. And certainly unintended consequences. And what I'm talking about is, right, we know that there's uh, Alternative facts on what's happening and one wrong tweet um, has sent uh, individual stocks um, dropping significantly. And so the, you know, he's certainly a wild card in terms of what he's going to say and what he's going to do. So it's a little bit of a mixed bag, his, the policies. Looking overseas, uh, our outlook is a little bit less favorable in general than compared to the United States. And that is that really we see, um, we see growth, but we really see growth being a lot slower, uh, specifically in developed markets. And some of that is uh, just secular trends with regards to productivity and demographics. And some of that is to issues that they have that they really have not um, addressed. We, we expect the Italian banking issues to be addressed in 2017, and they could be uh, disruptive for Europe. And the question is, how disruptive could that be outside of Europe? Um, there are gonna be elections in 2017 in France and Germany. We've seen a nationalistic or uber nationalistic um, sentiment, both in the United States and the UK. We would not be surprised to see that kind of sentiment spreading across to France and Germany as well. So again, um, it's more of a kind of a global trend and we're not sure that that global trend is gonna be positive for, uh, for global growth. We, they still have in developed markets in particular, uh, endemic issues such as high unemployment. Uh, they've had uh, significant quantitative easing in Japan as well as in China. Uh, and that's what helped slow down kind of that, the China drop. But in the meantime, that can't be added ad nauseum. Um, and so the question is, okay, where are we with China and their soft landing? But here's a positive thing before we kind of go into, you know, detail the year ahead, and that's um, poverty. So over the last 30 years, the population in poverty has dropped significantly. I mean, it's really just an astounding number if you think about, right, for centuries, I mean, or thousands of years, the level of poverty and the rapid rate of decline in, in poverty globally. And that's something that I think we don't take the time to recognize um, that, again, the world's in a, a lot better place than it was even just 30 years ago. Okay, so that was kind of, again, the positive side. On the negative, those countries that are in the brown um, are countries that have, we talked about US and high debt relative to GDP, relative to what, uh, what they're producing. Uh, we have that same problem in Europe as well. Um, just even worse, really. And you have what the pigs, Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain being debt levels greater than 100%. You have Belgium as well. And a lot of the developed European countries are, but they're pretty darn close. So what does that mean? Basically, the research has shown that when debt levels get to that high, growth slows. That's just the relationship that's out there. So GDP growth slows down, and that's what Europe is faced with. And it's gonna take them time to basically deleverage, which they're not gonna be able to do because of, again, problems that, with the Italian banks, problems with Deutsche Bank. Um, they're, some of that debt is either they're gonna have to haircut uh, savers or they're going to have to nationalize debt. We don't know exactly what they're gonna do. Either way, that doesn't bode well for growth.
Um, notice, by the way, in Eastern Europe, the situation is different. Their level of debt relative to GDP is in much better shape. They're in much better economic shape than their more developed neighbors. So what does that mean for global growth? Global growth in developed markets, we expect in 2016 and really to continue in 2017 is gonna be relatively slow. So in other words, one to 2% in growth. I wanna note in Russia and Brazil for 2016, growth was negative, primarily due to oil. And we do expect some recovery in, in both Russia and Brazil um, as oil prices have increased off their lows. They're still low, but compared to their highs, but certainly a lot better than they were. Um, and as we said, you know, U.S. growth being in the twos, kind of that plow horse moving forward, not too fast, not too slow, but continuing to, to grow. Um, outside of the developed markets, we do see higher growth in emerging markets and in Asia. Uh, and, and we expect that to continue. Now, that growth rate is not going to be the same. In other words, China was growing at double-digit growth rates. We don't expect that level, while we expect growth, it may, we probably will not see that level of growth. What does, that mean? what does that really mean when we say, okay, well, we don't see uh, significant growth? Well, what that's meant is really earnings. So corporate earnings for most other countries compared to US have been significantly less. So as corporate earnings have been less, um, stock markets have reflected accordingly. And so for the last, uh, what is it, four years or so, basically, and continuing this year, the U.S. stock market has basically trounced uh, international stock markets. Interestingly enough, when we look at even from a forward earning basis, the U.S. stock market is a little bit more expensive than developed markets, but not that expensive comparatively speaking. So we're not necessarily seeing just this raging uh, global growth, at least not yet in developed markets. Emerging markets notice something a little bit different. Emerging markets we're seeing is actually cheap. So much better debt situation, much better valuation. What does that mean? It means probably higher growth. Moving on to the fixed income side, um, we want to take a quick look at global rates, central bank policy, and inflation. So this is probably hard to see, um, but this shows the rise in global debt uh, in the last, uh, 25 years or so, and you can see global debt's exploded. Part of that is due to stimulus, um, and the world basically has been trying to stimulate economies. Uh, we just talked about a little bit Japan and China, where they have negative rates, um, and in Europe in, in particular, their debt has increased dramatically. Um, today, if you look at interest rates across the world, uh, the United States looks very interesting from an investment perspective, and that's probably one of the things that actually keeps rates down here, is that it's, it's drawing investment from across the world. When Germany and Japan have zero or negative rates, people don't want to invest there, right? You don't really want to pay somebody to hold your money for you. You want to get a return. So the United States looks relatively attractive. Um, we think that probably continues uh, as the Fed raises rates here as well. So if you look at a long term, this is 145 years, you might remember back in 1871. <laughs> um, rates were low for a really long time. Um, and it was only in sort of the modern economy that rates went really high and monetary policy took over and uh, we tried to crush inflation. Rates have trended down dramatically since the 80s and now are back to almost, you could say, more normal levels where they are today. So fears about you know, much higher rates ahead probably are unfounded. We're at about 10-year um, ten, ten rates are about 2.5% today. We don't think they move dramatically higher. Interest rates, particularly long rates, are a reflection of inflation expectations. Now, the Federal Reserve Bank can adjust short-term rates, but they can't have any direct effect on long-term rates. So when we look at inflation, it's been pretty stable for quite a long time. And we're currently running around a 2% inflation rate, which is the Federal Reserve target. Now, when I say that, I'm looking at the, at the uh, core inflation here, the red line. Overall CPI, the blue line bounces around a lot more because it includes food and energy. So as food and energy prices we know are more volatile, we take that out and look at sort of what they call core CPI. So 
we think um, we think again that long rates probably don't have to go uh, much much higher based on where CPI is. We don't think there's a lot of inflation in the system. This is um, maybe difficult to read again, and it's unusual, right? I don't know. I've never seen a slide like this. This is the only one I've ever seen. But what it's showing is the forecastability of economists, which is really good, right? So you can see since the 90s, every time they forecast where rates are going to be every five years, they're way off. So, <laughs> so back in 96, they thought rates were going to be higher. They went lower. And that's been the trend every single period, including today. So even today, they're forecasting much higher rates. And that just has not been the case. We can say that they're consistent. So in trying to look at where long-term rates are going to go, these are some of the factors that go into that decision-making process. So we have seen slowing productivity growth and slowing population growth, and those feed into inflation. Again, positive for long rates. Risk off events um, and demand for those long bonds, again, positive for long-term rates. The same time, pushing the other way is tightening monetary policy. Again, not a direct effect on long-term rates, but perhaps hinting that there's a little more inflation ahead from the Fed's perspective. So what are the takeaways? We've given you a lot of information about uh, US international markets as well as interest rates. Uh, so what are the takeaways for you and what are, what are we thinking for 2017? Um, so first, a couple of takeaways. Um, number one, again, we talked about the, the resiliency of the stock market, the stealth recession, and the fact that the stock market's held up, and there's really a moral to that story. And the moral is that um, those who get excited by the individual events or feel like they need to sell out or trying to predict what's going to happen, they've been the loser. And they've been the loser because the recoveries uh, shortly thereafter have been significant and have been much higher than the, than the drops. So it's kind of the right, keep calm and carry on. That's really been the kind of the motto for uh, the last, I don't know, since 2009. And we expect that that's going to continue um, that philosophy. We also always talk about diversification, how diversification is so critical. This really illustrates um, why diversification is so important. The red line on the top is long-term bonds. The blue line is stocks, and the gold line on the bottom is uh, the bond aggregate. And during times of stress and downturns in the stock market, bonds, long bonds, have performed extremely well. So in, in every instance, in 2014, in, in the middle of 2015, early 16, when stocks get hit, bonds have done well. They act as a hedge. And while we don't want necessarily our entire portfolio to be in bonds by any means, they do act as in a hedge. And over this time period, in fact, bonds outperform stocks over most of the last several years, only until the last uh, part of 2016. At the same time, the, uh, the bond aggregate on the bottom doesn't move very much. You don't see much volatility there. Again, a piece of the portfolio adds sort of ballast to that portfolio and helps reduce volatility. The other thing uh, we wanted to point out is, and this slide is a little hard, and I'll try to explain what the pieces are. The bars here are the end of year returns by year going back to 1980. And notice that uh, 28 out of 37 years have been positive in the stock market. The red dots here are the intra year returns. So in other words, um, I mean, what you'll see is that, you know, most years the stock market is positive, but during almost every single year, you're going to have a correction you're going to have a negative drop in the stock market and a negative drop in returns. And that's pretty consistent. And so we, are, we, we feel that 2017 is not going to be any different than the last 30 years and that there will be a correction in the stock market. And you're going to see one of these red dots when we plot it out for 2017. So our expectation is that there will be volatility there will be a correction in the stock market in 2017, just like there is every other year. Um, and so we, we expect that that's going to continue as well. It's going to be scary. It's not going to be pleasant. Um, it will be like a roller coaster, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's where the year is going to end up. 
And so again, it's part of just thinking about the long term. So we hedge ourselves because of the fact that we, we want to diversify, but we also, um, we also have to look at what we think is going to happen. So overall, for the U.S. stock market, we see continued GDP growth. We see the Fed continuing to raise rates this year as the economy improves, maybe two or three times. We think inflation remains in check. Um, overall, we think a positive environment for stocks. At the same time, we think bonds are likely to surprise on the upside as they probably overshot early last year and they probably overshot on the downside the late part of last year. So we're pretty constructive uh, going into this year for bonds as well. Um, that being said, so our, our base case again is that stock market is going to be going up. We're going to be seeing kind of growth in the economy as well. That's pretty much our base case. Uh, we have a, a kind of alternative case of, we talked about stealth recession, but we could see a surprise on the up. Um, what's the caution to the stock picture? The caution to the stock picture is that we do think there's gonna be increased volatility um, it's been, volatility has been low in the stock market lately. We think that's likely to change. Um, and we do believe in the theory that when everybody's saying the same thing, um, watch out because something else is gonna happen. And so we're much more, I would say, cautiously optimistic than um, a lot of the people who, a lot of the, I don't know, our peers are in the industry. Um, and so, you know, that we are recognizing that the headwinds are out there, whether it's an outside shock, whether it's increased wage pressure, increasing dollar. And so certainly looking at that as well. But overall, we don't expect there to be a recession in 2017. We do expect there to be growth um, in the economy and as such in the market as well. So one of the possible places for uh, risk is international. More impact from Brexit, we heard even this morning. Um, that Parliament has to vote before they can enact Article 50. There was some confusion about how that was going to work. Um, so overall, we think slower growth in Europe. China continues to grow, but at a slower rate. I think we're, everybody's pretty comfortable with that. Um, stocks positive overseas, but we prefer the U.S. to overseas markets. In emerging markets, valuations, like Seth said, were, were compelling. And um, it's actually started to be reflected a little bit this year. Emerging markets is the top performing asset class so far this year in the first month. Um, on interest rates, uh, we do believe the Fed is going to follow through and increase interest rates. Uh, it will be somewhere between two to three times is our expectation. Uh, but again, on an absolute basis, the increases are somewhat nominal, 25 basis points each, 0.25% uh, each time. So somewhere between in short-term interest rates going up to by 0.5 to 0.75%. Um, and on the long end, we think that's really the big question mark. Uh, we think a lot of the rate movement has probably been overdone in the last several months. And um, there are long-term secular trends that we think are going to keep long-term rates lower for a lot longer than uh, what most people expect. Uh, again, long-term rates tend to be highly correlated to inflation. They still tend to be a very good place to be um, as part of a portfolio in terms of dampening risk. So in summary, um, we are uh, positive on the stock market, you know, potential surprise on the earnings side. Trump brings uh, some positives, some negatives. Overall, we think today the positives seem to outweigh the negatives in terms of impact to the stock market. Again, not political. Um, Europe, we expect growth to be uh, significantly, I don't know if significantly, but closer to 1% growth in Europe compared to the US, uh, which is closer to two. So uh, elections we think are gonna be interesting. And again, the Italian banking crisis. Our, expect, our inflation expectations are fairly modest um, and will be consistent with kind of prior years. And we talked about Fed raising rates and more volatility um, during the year. And with that, we're happy to answer any questions. Yeah, uh, Barry. Now, this is a question about employment factors and growth. So unemployment is low, but I always read that underemployment is extremely high, like in the 20% range. 
And at the same time, I also read that there are lots of jobs that go higher paying jobs that go unfilled <coughs> because of lack of education. We also know that under that unemployment overseas is pretty high mm -hmm. in Europe and the European educational system, they have a lot higher educated workers there. So I'm just wondering the, the sort of like the, the collage of those kind of employment factors. Um, is there another solution moving forward that might actually create uh, workers who can take some of these higher paying jobs um, that Know, can sort of stimulate growth a little bit more, in part more because of the underemployment. Yep. I guess I'd be you want me to take that one? You immigration. Want? So yeah, I think there's two. So there's two issues that we think, and we did talk about this as we were, we were putting this together. And so let's talk about the underemployment first. So the issues I think with underemployment is, are those people actually going to be entering back into the workforce or not? Is this a permanent situation or is this temporary? what it appears to be is more of a permanent situation. So if, the, if it is a permanent situation, then we really can't, we, we can't count them as uh, potential employees. We do think that this is an issue uh, with the fact that it, the, the lack of employees, the lack of educated employees is a constraint on growth. As such, we think uh, our opinion is the immigration policies that are being proposed by the administration is going to be harmful to the future growth of, again, not political, just look at the stock market. From the stock market, we think that that is going to be, those policies are harmful to the growth of the country and of the stock market. If you, um, if you look at, I think they call U9 and U6, they're different unemployment pieces to the unemployment picture. If you look at all the curves together, they have all moved in tandem. At level of, um, of underemployment, it, it's moved in tandem with the entire employment rate. Yeah. So, I don't know what the exact absolute level is, but they've, they have moved together, and so it's still an issue. Yep. Any other, please? So we gather data from a variety of sources that, uh, whether it's from the Federal Reserve or from, uh, this was from Capital Group, uh, uh, you know, a US-based company that has offices globally um, that, that provide us that specific slide. Um, so I would say that we have kind of our own experiences, but the experience out there and, and keep in mind that you have countries like China where there's like a billion people and the amount of people that have moved out of poverty, um, in Africa as well, just some major changes, the rise in some respects, they've leapfrogged certain technology, right? Phones didn't really exist in Africa, but cell phones do. And so. Right. They didn't, weren't able to string up phone tower. They weren't able to string up phone lines, but I had a friend who worked for a number of years in Nigeria who was building cell towers. Um, and so that, those kind of things were really happening that allowed kind of this almost like a leapfrog in, um, in again, in terms of global wealth or, or moving up from the, the level of poverty. So yeah, it's something that I think uh, the media does not give enough you know, right, the media doesn't give enough exposure to some of the good uh, that's been happening globally. Yeah, so so. That's a bond question. If you uh, had a slide up that looked at short term bonds and long term bonds, uh, the bond market to me always seems to be divided into three sectors short, long, and intermediate. Just the sort of the intermediate uh, bond. Well, it's, it's, that's a good question. There, there's a lot more to the bond market, right? There's all kinds of pieces, but we try to keep it simple. Um, the intermediate piece we think probably is a little more of a pivot point than necessarily uh, a lateral movement. We think short rates move up and long rates probably don't move as much. So we probably see the yield curve twist a little more than just shift higher. So, uh, you know, intermediate term bonds should kind of earn their yield more than anything, which isn't very high. Yeah, please. <laughs> 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 My head's getting more and more appointed. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, so in general, so we, that's something we are continuing to work. I mean, we work on this all the time and we're continuing to work on. Um, in general, we've shifted um, and, and the managers that we've been using as well have, have pivoted towards the back half of the year to be more US uh, relative to Europe. In other words, some of our managers are, are global managers. And so, uh, so they have been moving uh, to a higher percentage in, in US relative to, um, relative to international. So that's, that's one thing. We still believe in keeping on that hedge. We think the movement in the bond market was probably uh, too, too much, uh, at least in a short period of time. And so we do plan on kind of keeping um, our bond hedges more or less in place. Those are, are a couple of the big things. The small mid cap, that's one that we're really looking at. Um, and even though our, I'd say the, the struggle that we're having is that the data in terms of dollar, you know, the, the strength of the dollar, et cetera, would seem to indicate um, small mid cap is, the, is a better place to be. In some respects, that's already been reflected in market prices where you saw a 25% or more increase in small cap stocks and mid cap stocks really in the back half of the year versus US stocks. So that one, how much we're really gonna be pivoting to small mid cap, I think that that's already kind of baked in the cake at this point in time. <laughs> oh, good, I'm done. So what happens is, is that every one of you has different goals, different things in your life. So the answer to your question is that what, what these two have done, which has been incredible for somebody like me, has provided enough information so that I can have a very complex conversation with you about well, how do we invest in society? I'm going to want a lot more money coming in on an annual basis so that I can then start to take more risk and open yourself up to more volatility. Then we can turn around and change your asset allocation accordingly. Um, so, what a client is doing with regard to this information is allowing people like Andy, myself, the other advisors, to have meaningful conversations with you, but also into consideration what's important to you and making sure that you can sleep at night. So this isn't in an isolation. Investment plan isn't in isolation. It is coordinated with your personalities and your time horizon. The other thing is rebalancing. This is very crucial. In that if you get to a place where, hey, I feel like I should be a super important investor or super important good or something, when you walk into the office or we have a visit and you're 5% above or you're 5% below, what that target is, is that we want to do some different. And what we've always found is that making sure that you have at least a year's worth of cash to take care of your personal needs usually works, and that's not included in your asset allocation. So that's how we use this information, and that's how we kind of get it disseminated. Um, I just wanted to make sure. So I'll, I'll also add to that internally, so the day after Brexit and the day after the election, our investment committee uh, was getting together and kind of holding impromptu emergency meetings. And as you can imagine, the, uh, the conversations were very um, passionate. <laughs> Spirited. <laughs> yeah. Spirited and passionate. And so... <laughs> and so being able to kind of say, okay, well, looking at some of these slides and saying, 
look at what's happened when other kind of one-off events have happened and really staying the course. And even as making sure that we are kind of ahead, ahead of that and either reaching out to clients that have, you know, something that we as a, as a, as a team uh, saying to everyone and also working through, you know, we still got phone calls with, you know, People were like, oh my gosh, the world's gonna end. Um, and I would say, Andy, Andy said this to me. He said, the world only ends once. It's not now. And so um, kind of taking that advice to heart um, and really to, to move forward in, in terms of the strategies and really think long-term. So that's how we've, we've used it. And sometimes by, sometimes by doing something, but sometimes by doing nothing. Um, is really kind of the, this, where we take that, take away uh, some of the information. Yep. Um, yeah, thank you. I think, I don't know, I'll speak for Mark, I think for everyone. I think our passion for the industry, for the business, for the work we do is probably stronger than, I'll say, I'll speak for myself, but I think Steve would probably echo, stronger now than it has ever been. Um, every day we wake up, every day we go home, um, and try to think what can we do better? What can we think about? Uh, we're constantly, Mark and I are constantly passing slides to each other that are really boring to most people. Um, but really because our, our enthusiasm for the business, for the industry, for the work, uh, you yeah, know, we really live kind of Steve's motto of willing to be smarter tomorrow than we are today. And, and that passion for, for commitment, for service, for doing the investment work, doing the financial planning, um, is, is again, stronger today than it's ever been. But that's really important. I mean, and that's a kind of outlook is really positive, but we don't think this ride is gonna be smooth over the next 12 months, you know, or, or out. And we know that there's a bunch of wild cards um, out there. And so have that conversation with your advisor and have that conversation. We don't want to be in a situation where you're not sleeping at night and you're totally stressed out and you know, it necessitates a doctor's visit. Um, that's not what we're trying to accomplish here. And so certainly have that conversation um, and make sure you're in the portfolio that's right for you. And that's when Steve says, everyone's a snowflake. You got to find that that, that that makes sense for you, not necessarily that makes sense for, for you know, me per se. Okay, so with that, uh, thank you very much for, uh, do you want to yeah, say? So let me just close. Um, I'd like to call thank you, Dana, guys. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> First off, again, as we always say, thank you for allowing us to be part of your life. I hope one of the, so one of the major takeaways uh, and we're going to do another one later on, is, is that um, we may not have had all the answers. There's a lot of unknown, a lot of uncertainty. Presidents come and go. We've been doing this for many, many years. And Americans are really resilient. Markets tend to go up over time. You'll probably hear me say that a lot. And the data certainly supports that. But what, what we put in place and what we're spending a lot of time, and you can see it from this presentation, is um, we put some discipline into what we're doing and we continue to do that. Sure, we may not have the answers, but we're definitely researching, taking a look at everything, trying to figure out how all the pieces fit together, making sure that uh, we're putting together the right portfolios and strategies. And that changes for everybody. Everybody has their own kind of where their goals, objectives are, comfort levels. Um, and, that's what, and that's what we're doing behind the scenes. And sometimes you don't always see that up front, but there's a lot of a lot of information, a lot of due diligence behind the scenes, there's process, there's discipline, there's patience. Uh, and that hopefully when you put all those pieces together, it leads to good positive results for all of you to reach all your, your objectives and goals. And we we appreciate questions, we value those. Uh, there are definitely many ways to construct portfolios. Um, and we, we have our certain approach, and we seen it work, and we want to stick to that. But we're always open to, to questions. 
observation. So again, thank you and thank you. Thanks, Andy.